Ian Fritz, man, welcome to the show. I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, you, you got this book coming out. Let me pull it up. Uh, what the Taliban told me. I've been, I've been reading through it. I'm about halfway done. Um, really enjoyed it. The first part of it really sucked me in. Um, just cause just describing the gunships and stuff. Cause that's something I'm, you know, kind of have a background in as a JTAC. Uh, so it'd be, it'd be cool to hear more about what you did on them as in that support role. Um, but yeah, let's talk about why did you uh, why did you join the Air Force and uh, go the route that you did? Yeah, um, the short answer is because I have a lot going on otherwise. So I joined uh, at technically I was eighteen, but it was like a couple months shy of my nineteenth birthday. Yeah, uh, functionally right after high school because I I didn't get into college out of high school and I grew up in a small town in North Florida, um, and I was just a waiter at a Chinese restaurant and that was for the foreseeable future all i could do all i was qualified to do so i was trying to figure out you know what else to do with my life and i remembered that um in the 10th grade an air force recruiter had come to my high school and he had talked about this job of an airborne cryptologic linguist mm -hmm. you know he didn't he didn't really know what it was because like why would he he didn't do the job but he, he knew that it sounded sexy it sounded cool and he knew how to make it sound sexy and cool he was a good recruiter um <laughs> And I had sort of had this idea that if I had gone to college, I would have studied language in some form. So I said, oh, well, let me go. Maybe let's see if that's a thing. Like, is that still real? Um, so I went and found my recruiter in the town I grew up in. And he said, yeah, it's, it's still a thing, it's still real. Um, and I started the process from there. That's awesome. So I know in the book you talked about how multiple people in your family can speak multiple languages. And that's always been like a gift that – I know it's something I tell, I tell my own son, I'm like, look, you gotta look at it like math. You know, you have to do the problems over and over again. And then you start to remember it and you figure it out and then you can just do it. That it's, mm -hmm. that's kind of the same deal. I was never really good at foreign languages. My dad, he has that kind of, that talent. He can speak fluent mm -hmm. Spanish. He can do like sign language and stuff like that. Like he dedicates time to it. Uh, <clears throat> it's just not anything that I could see myself doing. You, in the book, you said you had multiple people in your own family that spoke multiple languages. You yourself weren't as adept to it at first. Did that having, I mean, and correct me if I'm wrong about what I'm talking about in the book. In the book, you said, I think you were in, in French in high school and it wasn't really something that came to you or that you were that great at. So if that was the case, what drove you to do that job? Um, yeah, I, I was not good French in high school. Part of that was like the high school I went to and, and but most of it was me and not me not, you know, trying, I think. Yeah. I, I mean, it's a, it's a really good question that I, I don't know that I still have like our, that I, I probably could have answered really well then. And mm -hmm. now I'm like, I don't, why, you know, why did I, why was I so set on that? Cause I, my contract said, you know, one alpha eight X one airborne cryptologic linguist. Like that's what I was going to do. And I, if I had failed out, like I wasn't going to do anything else. I was dead set on that. And I, the best answer I can like think of trying to remember back is that basically um, the reason my the members of my family spoke multiple languages is because uh, both of my mother's parents were missionaries, and so they. My mother grew up in West Africa. Her father and her mother, you know, lived there for decades as missionaries, and there had been some idea within the family that like somehow I would do that work mm. and a, a major part of the, at least their role of missionaries was so my grandfather spoke many languages and that's like really important right you can't proselytize in English if someone doesn't understand English so I, there, there had always been this idea that I would do that and I think that was the best idea I had of like what I could do in the military that wouldn't be you know, just a generic job or something. And yeah. that also wouldn't be like, like what you did. Cause I could never have done that. <laughs> well, I mean, we all say that, right. I say when I see like corpsmen or medics, you know, in actual combat scenarios, that's, that's a job where I'm like, man, I couldn't do that. I mean, it, cause you know, you're dealing with like the, what you're dealing with on a, on a day to day, but I guess it's every person deals with it differently, but I think I probably could deal with it, deal with it if I had to, but you know, but I know what you're saying. So I want to get back to, you were saying that you came from a small town, didn't really have a lot going on. So you joined the military. You know, a lot of people dog on the military that it's like a no other option kind of deal. But mm. I don't really see it like that, especially the Air Force, because the Air Force is the hardest one to get into. I, I think maybe now the Space Force is because of the uh, requirements yeah. and stuff like that. 
But the Air Force was one where you had you had to have graduated high school. You could not, not have gotten in any kind of trouble, especially a job like yours that's going to require a TS clearance down the road. I don't know. I don't see it as that, but I do see it as someone that may have come from a low income background as a way to vault them into the at least lower middle class at first and, you know, give them some opportunities they may not have had had they stayed in their hometown. You know, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I say there's no other option because like, I had no other option. I'm not, you know, I don't think of it writ large that way. I think it's, you know, a wonderful, yeah, I, I grew up like quite poor many time, many years. And now I live a very good, comfortable life. I got to go to college. Like I got to travel around the country, all these things. And, and I sort of wish it was open to more people in some form or fashion, right? Like a greater civil service or something, because mm-hmm. it, I don't know of another way. Like if you think about like the Peace Corps, okay, but you have to go live abroad for two years and like you have to learn a language and like maybe you're not capable of doing that for whatever reason or I, other small, small, small civil service, but like the military is the largest entity that could take people from places, right, that they just couldn't otherwise get out of and, and help sure. them exactly like you said, like move up social class or education class or income class or whatever. Mm-hmm. I, but that is like maybe the greatest thing that it offers to, to American citizens. Yeah, for sure. And I think I miss, um, a misconception a lot of like everyday Americans that don't have any idea of what goes on in the military have is that it's all focused on combat where in some, <laughs> in some point, yes. Okay. It's all focused on combat at whatever, but an admin guy isn't likely to get in combat. And most of their job is going to be like an office job, like a normal nine to five office job. And they're going to learn some stuff along the way. You know, there's like a, I talk about like the hope and the mercy, those two ships that get sent to different places when there's nat- uh, natural disasters. I'm like, see, you know, there's stuff like that that happens that people don't even realize. Like you could be a part of that. Um, I, I'm from a military family, so I've seen it as a, um, I don't know, I've always kind of thought I was going to join. And then mm-hmm. I thought it was a really good opportunity while I was in. And I took advantage of, you know, when I was in, when I first came in, I didn't like my job for the first few years. And I ended up switching over from being a mechanic to being a JTAC or being a Ford observer, then on to JTAC. But it, and that's the kind of opportunities that it allows. And you know, what you were talking about being 19 years old, being in a town, like, what am I going to do? I'm not going to school. I'm kind of working at a dead end job. There's a lot of people out there like that. That's a lot of like teenagers that are trying to figure out, you know, should I go to college where right now college is being demonized because of, you know, a lot of different things that go on in colleges at the same time, you know, blue collar work, people see that as like, well, yeah, I might get paid pretty good up front, but I'm going to break my back over 20 years. So is it worth it in the end kind of deal? It's a weird time frame for kids, you know? Um, I do. I feel for them. Even if you get past like, yeah, whatever's happening in colleges sort of like politically or philosophically, just the outright cost of it. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. And then the, if you go, you can look at people study, you know, the trends of return on investment of a, of a bachelor's degree now. And it's like, okay. I spent 150 grand for what? Yeah, yeah, it's it is insane, man, and it's um, it's and not to get off like I guess onto like political topics. In my opinion, it's brought on by the government being involved in like the loan process. You know that shouldn't be the government shouldn't be part of the loan process for colleges. Ever since the government has gotten themselves involved in guaranteed loans. It, the cost has gone up because they know that the government it's guaranteed loans from the government. It's going to get paid. And the amount of like leadership in these schools is out is just crazy. I got out and I recommend, and I, even though I, I rail on college sometimes about some of the stuff that they do, I recommend every veteran uses their GI bill. Okay. Maybe you use it to go to a four year university. Maybe you use it to go to a two year school, like a community college and do some technical training. Maybe you use it to go to, you know, Wyo tech or something like that and learn how to work on cars. But there's so many opportunities for it. Don't, don't get in your own mind that you think that it's just like a traditional four year experience and understand that you're getting an opportunity. Like you said, people can go into $150,000 of debt real quick, especially if you go to a private school, like USC is right up the road. You know, imagine what the tuition there is for four years. Right. And you don't have to worry about that because you have the GI Bill and, and a lot of colleges have these yellow ribbon uh, programs where they pay the, the difference if the GI Bill doesn't cover it. But yeah, man, um, <laughs> that is a little quick uh, thing about college. Let's talk about 
so you joined the Air Force. You know, you really didn't have that that military influence in your life. When you got to boot camp and stuff, like, was it what you thought? You know, did you did you see Full Metal Jacket or anything and go, okay, that's what everyone does, right? They watch Full Metal Jacket, then they go to boot camp? Yeah, I mean, I, so, I mean, we don't, like, right, Air Force, it's, it's basic training. It's not even boot camp, right? Like, I, you know, compared to what, like, Marines, Army, and, and even Navy, it's like, probably sort of kid glovey is my guess. Okay. Um, I mean, I had, I, I, looking back now, I think I was a little, I was pretty fortunate that my, um, uh, TI, they're not DIs, they're TIs in the Air Force, t- training instructor, I think. He had been Army, and he had been, I want to say he had been a mechanic in Army. And so he was, like, real tough, uh, in, in a really good way. Mm-hmm. Like, we had guys like me who just, like, knew nothing, <laughs> and were pretty soft, um, it was very, it was basic training. I was in, um, when I did it, it was six and a half weeks. I think it's now eight and a half. It was sort of transitioning at that okay. time. And honest to God, the thing I most remember is that it was just super busy. And sort of weeks and months after I left basic training, I found out that it was because they had stuffed the eight and a half week like curriculum, like all the stuff that they had planned on doing in eight and a half weeks for future mm-hmm. basic training into the six and a half weeks that we did. So I, all I really remember is I was just like, we just never don't do anything. Like you hear about, you know, you talk to other people who went before, or you talk to people from other branches. So like, yeah, we spent a lot of time, you know, polishing stuff, shining things, like doing kind of like sweaty work or whatever. And we just like ran around all these like meetings and other than drill and, you know, PT and all that stuff. Um, my, but my TI was maybe closer to Full Metal Jacket in that he did yell an awful lot. And he, he uh, memorably like, I don't know what kind of bed you guys had, but ours were, you know, there's like metal slats that you plunk into four corners and they're just like on poles. And he just like kicked one in the middle of the night and flipped the dude out because <laughs> you could just kick it straight up. But that, that was probably the closest I got to anything like that. Nice. That's still fun though. You know, that's it. I think people would be surprised by how many kids it's just a shock to be woken up every morning and told to make their bed, you know, like, so a little bit of discipline goes a long ways probably. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, after that experience getting, and then moving on to, you're going to go to your, your job training, you know, what was, what were the thoughts like after boot camp? Some people, some people get out of their basic training and then go, man, this wasn't for me. And, or like, they just, they've got that training mindset where they're just getting kicked along the way. You're the new guy. You're getting marched everywhere. You're not allowed to do anything on your own. Were you still okay with your decision at that point? Or were, you know, you regretting it at all? Uh, I was okay with it. I mean, the thing about, so like airborne and linguist specifically is it's, my training was three years. Um, that's long, but the, the average is like a year and a half. You have like five tech schools, I think. Mm. So I, I love basic training in, and it's at Laxland Air Force Base, for the Air Force, like everybody goes there. And there's um, Medina, which is like an annex technically across the street. And that's why I went like a mile across the road to my to my next school. And it's like a three week, just fundamentals. It's aircrew fundamentals of just like, here's what a plane is, right? Like here's how flight works. Here's how helicopters work. Like very, very simple stuff. Um, but it was probably, it was like the more introduction to like, okay, fast paced learning, that sort of thing. I think to like try and answer your question after that, I went to language school and that is, that is the real, probably the most, the hardest part and it has the highest washout rate of linguist training. And that was where I was like, at the very beginning, I think probably everyone has this feeling of like, Oh boy, what did I sign up for? Because at first learning a language that quickly is, is like daunting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and the Defense Language Institute is well known within the military. Even people like me that haven't been, it's known to be a pretty tough and pretty like the people that come out of it are pretty well trained. You know, you're not going to get much <laughs> yeah. better training yeah. than, than what they're offering there for for language. Um, before before we talk about that, you have to qualify to even take that. And I've heard about this test where you got to take uh, like a made up language can you kind of talk about those requirements to even get into a, a linguist job like like what you had? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you first have to like get it. There's a, I don't know what it is anymore. There's a minimum score on the ASVAB. So like when I, I met a recruiter and um, I had to lose a bunch of weight, he was like, you're too fat. So I had to lose much weight. And I came back and there's a different recruiter. It sort of shuttled through. And this guy I was like, hey, I want to do this job. And he's like, um, 
you're from Lake City, Florida. Like he didn't think I was going to get high enough as fast. Mm-hmm. So that's the first hurdle. And I did, and it was fine. And then, yeah, you take this test called the Defense Language Aptitude Battery or the D Lab. And it's probably, or like this is what people say, it's based on Esperanto, which is a, a synthetic language that this um, Polish, Polish ophthalmologist invented in like the early 1900s or something. But it's as near as I can sort of looking back, it's sort of just like a functionally like a, a logic test of how quickly you can assimilate rules. Like, so they just, and it's rules around language, but they say, you know, the structure of a sentence is going to be subject, object, verb, or verb, subject, object, or verb, object, subject, or something like that. And it's all, you have to very, very quickly figure that out. And then there's a, there's a decent amount of, they play, you know, sound A, sound B, sound C, which of these is different from the others? Because I do think that some people, you know, just the way that their brains are wired, they can't necessarily hear the difference in sounds. So mm. like if you have to learn Chinese, right, that's a requirement. It's a tonal language. Um, so there's a lot of that. It, it is a really hard test. I mean, I barely passed it. Uh, I got like two points higher than the cutoff or something. And I think now I wouldn't have passed it because I think they ra- the Air Force at least raised the cutoff because the Air Force did have the highest uh, minimum requirement on it. You know, it's another thing that's interesting, like you're you're learning Dari and Pashto. At the time, obviously, I guess a really important language to have because we're, you know, operating in the country and stuff all the time. If you, if you were still in right now, you know, what would they be, what would they have you be doing? You know, is it, you still work on the Intel side, just doing that kind of thing, like still translating. I mean, when we're not in an active country and it's not a really common language, you know, at least right. if I know different kinds of Chinese, that's could be pretty common in a lot of different areas. Whereas right. Dari and Pashto are pretty specific. Um, I suspect by now, so you can get kind of, you, you talked about retraining earlier, you can get relanguaged. So you stay as a linguist, but they send you to learn a new language, either a DLI or uh, there are other places. They're just like small DLIs, I guess, like DLI light. Mm-hmm. Um, I would imagine a lot of Pashto linguists are probably be languished by now. Cause yeah, we're not, we're not operating there like in any meaningful way. And there's not. Maybe, you know, like, you know, intelligence work against the Taliban, I guess. But mm. um, And then maybe a bunch of Dari. So Dari is, is functionally the same language as Farsi. It's basically just like an accent and some vocabulary differences. Mm. Probably a lot of Dari people got, you know, pushed to doing more Iran-focused work, right, instead of Afghanistan-focused work. But I would bet I would be relanguaged. I bet if I joined right now, right, the um, – the, I mean, you were in roughly the same time I was, right? Like every service had a huge recruitment during Iraq mm-hmm. and then they got rid of a lot of people and they, because they like had over recruited and sort of the same thing with languages They'll you know, it takes a long time to train a linguist. So they train up all these languages. And then by the time they have enough people, it's like, Oh, maybe that mission is going down. So like, I don't know how many Russian linguists there were when Ukraine got invaded, but probably not enough. <laughs> so yeah. probably there's a huge huge number of students learning Russian right now. That's so crazy to think that, that you would just have, Oh, Hey, by the way, we're not in Afghanistan anymore. So I need you to learn this language now and be like, ah, oh, man, you know, like, that's yeah, not I mean, easy. People who, yeah, they had learned like, um, like Serbian cause they'd been around mm-hmm. in the night forever. And then, yeah, I was like, well, there you go. What are we, we're not doing that anymore. So go learn Dari. Like, now you can do work in the next place we're in. Yeah. So when you get to the DLI, when you get to the Defense Language Institute, what's it like? You know, is it a, what we, a lot of us in the military refer to as like a gentleman's course where they're not really tough. You know, the focus here is learning, doing the job and learning what we're learning. The military stuff is there, but it's not like, you know, I'm not, there's not drill instructors or anybody yelling at you. It's a pretty more relaxed environment. Is it like that or something um, it is definitely more relaxed. It's not, I, I, I only say this because, so the, the school I went to after the sergeants we had there, like routinely sort of, you know, would say, oh, you're not at college anymore. They had this idea that it was like a free for all, like mm-hmm. that we were like wearing cities every day and doing whatever we want. It's not, it's not that far, you know, loose, but, um, significantly lighter. Yeah. Because eight hours every day, you're not getting taught by the military. You're getting taught by civilian instructors, right? Non-native civilian instructors. Um, like 90% of the instructors are not, not Americans. So there is, you know, yeah, you have PT a few times a week or whatever. P- 
people mess up and you have to, everybody has to go to formation, you know, there's a DUI or something like that, but you're, and you, you wear a uniform every day, but yeah, it's, it's pretty separated from like the big military stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I could, it's, it kind of, how could it not be, you know, when you're talking about, yeah, I don't think there's a better, I I honestly, like if you tried to, it's exhausting as it is. And Mm -hmm. then there would be periods of time when, you know, our squadron would say, Oh, we're going to do more PT. We're going to do more this, do more that. And you just watch like everybody's just like falling asleep, like in class or, or like falling asleep on a drill field or something like that. It's like, no, if you, if you're expected to be in school for 40 hours a week, like, that's probably all you can do. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, God, that would be so mind draining too, all day long. And just, I don't know, just kind of going through it. It, it, It's such a weird, I mean, it's such a weird environment compared to like a lot of the other schools, especially I didn't go to, well, when I was a mechanic, it was all Marines. It was on a Marine base. When I was in a Ford observer, it was on a army base, but we had a Marine detachment. Do you guys stay within your own branches there? Is everybody just kind of lumped together into one kind of big group unit, you're, you know? You're like separated out, right? So there's like army stuff and maybe stuff and Marine stuff. Um, and then Air Force, like every, everybody has their own unit and their own leadership and all that. The classes are completely intermixed. Yeah. So you could be in school. I was in school with um, one, yeah, one soldier and a few Marines. Uh, no, maybe because like Afghanistan's a landmark country. <laughs> yeah. But, uh but the other so like chinese that's like everybody right you can imagine that like everybody would be involved in that like every service would maybe have a requirement for there um probably i think arabic has basically everybody because of the number of countries who speak arabic mm-hmm. but yeah they get they get really mixed into bigger languages so like chinese and arabic they're just like china's a much bigger country than afghanistan arabic is spoken in way more places so you have much bigger classes like a hundred and something people or something oh, well. like that And so you get much, much more intermingling. How many people don't make it through this training? You know, make it through the language training. Yeah, it's, it's language specific and like year specific because, um, the language thing, I think it's sort of obvious, like certain languages are harder than other languages. Yeah. And then like year specific, a lot of it comes down to, a lot of it can come down to, uh, your teachers. So my class, I think we had probably like a 40% dropout. Wow. Uh, but like Pashtu at the time, so when I, I learned Pashtu separately, and like we can talk about that later, but at the time Pashtu had like a 70% fail rate or something like that. Like really, really, really high. And especially when you think about that could be like, that's anywhere within a year. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people will fail out immediately, right? A very smart human I knew, he was like a master mechanic, like BMW master mechanic, super smart guy. Uh, he just could not learn a language. Like that's not how his brain worked. So he failed out you know, pretty early. But then other people will go through a whole course and they get to the end, and you have to take a final exam, and they can't pass the final exam. Mm. Okay, well they just invested a year of training or a year and a half in some other languages, and like lo and behold, nope, you didn't make the cut. Dang. Yeah, I, I'm that. I'm like your friend. I cannot, <laughs> for whatever reason, I can pick up a little bit here and there. I had to learn a little bit of. Uh, I think we were doing Dari. Um, cause I went as an Afghan advisor in 2013 and mm-hmm. language is one of those things, especially when you're in a class, especially when it's a high paced class, cause they're just trying to, you know, introduce you. If you don't, if you don't learn the basics and kind of keep up with that part of it, everything else down the line is just a wash. Like I'd be sitting in class and talking, I'm like, I have no idea what he's saying right now because I was lost yesterday. You know what I'm saying? It's like, <laughs> right. yeah, that was a problem I had. I mean, I just could not do it. Um, so I, like I said, I understand what your friend, it's, it's no different than any other job. You know, like I told people that was like being a JTAC, I knew a lot of guys that tried out to go be a JTAC and didn't, not a lot, but some that went, tried out and just didn't make it super good dude, super good forward observers, you know, really good with what they do. But it, there's something in that high paced environment of what we were doing that they just couldn't, you know, distinct click for them. Um, and it's not that they're bad at their job or anything like that. It's just that just wasn't the job field for them, you know? And I imagine right. language learning is a, a lot like that. Yeah. Or it's like the, you know, I, I maybe it's the same for learning to be a JTAC, but like, I bet there's plenty of people who truly like one more day, like one day slower, they could have got it. 
Yeah, but for sure. The military has just said like, no, this is the standard. Like, this is what we're gonna do, and, and that's fine. Like, you have to have standards. Um, I do think that like, is assuming you're not like like you or like my friend, like someone who's just you know wired that way. It's like I can never, I couldn't be a mechanic. I know that because I'm spatially super dumb. Like, I don't like, I can't see parts and like, how things interconnect. I'm really bad at it. Mm. Um, but assuming you're not like wired, some like weird, right, or just different. And you, you know, you pass the D-Lab and all that stuff, you get to language school. If you really, if you try, like, it, you will learn. Like, you, you just have to because it's so much time every day with, you know, native instructors. But can you learn according to the military standard? Yeah, that's a very different question. Yeah, for sure. Now, let's talk about when you get to your unit, when you finish training, your, your initial language training and you're heading off to your unit, how hard is it to maintain that language like capability? Because it's not like you're sitting around a whole group of dudes like you that speak the same. You're probably one of one, one of two, one of three at most, you know, how, how hard is that to maintain? You know, what do they have you do and stuff when you first show up? Yeah. That's a good, so what's, it's maybe a little bit worse because you, so like I finished language school the first time. And then I went to my next tech school, which was in um, West Texas, at uh, Goodfellow Air Force Base. I was there for like at least three months and I was there with a lot of my classmates. So we would, you know, just goof off and like, we'd still speak the language because we could, it's, it's like a superpower, right? You can just talk and nobody can understand you. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're not in this formal classroom environment. And then I had to go back to Sear. I'd already been to Sear before language school, but I had to go back and then I had to do another, uh, like water survival training. So I didn't get to my unit till five months, four months after I graduated language school and then yeah i mean you um i think bigger units so most everyone language they go to omaha they go to off air force base and there you'll you'll have a lot of people who speak your language um and they have like a very my understanding is that there they have like formalized ways to keep up with your language mm-hmm. that i got assigned to um, afsoc to air force special operations command it's a much smaller unit where yeah there were i don't know 10 people who spoke Dari or something so we were kind of like, it's, you're literally left to your own devices of like how you decide to keep up with that. For Dari, for, for Pashtu later, um, it can be harder because there's not as much stuff in the world. So you can imagine if you're a Spanish linguist, like, okay, go turn on the radio. Mm-hmm. It's like the number one artist in the world is Bad Bunny right now, right? So cool, Spanish is available to you. It, even if you spoke Russian, there's Russian film, cinema, newspapers, that sort of thing. When you get into the niche languages, it gets harder because there's just like not as much material. You'd really have to sit down and be like, okay, I'm going to read the BBC in Farsi today. Like that is what I'm going to do instead of like, I want to go watch a movie in another language. Um, if you, beyond that, the, the Air Force at least has sort of every year you have to get retrained to some extent. So, um, or every two years or something. And they, they send you back to school for a month and you get like a month of dedicated, you know, one-on-one training with not one-on-one, but classroom training um, Mm -hmm. and stuff. And that's, that's how they sort of, they help, but it's part of your job. It is your job requirement, but you can't fail your language. You can't fail your exams. Um, you, You can, but then you have to retake and all that sort of stuff. And that affects whether you're qualified or your job. So much of it is just like, it's on you. You gotta keep it up or you can't do this job anymore. Yeah, that's so that's what I kind of figured was like, got to find newspapers, got to find YouTube videos, maybe, you know, or whatever um, you can in that language and just kind of immerse yourself as much as possible. Yeah, that's that's got to be tough, though. So you're talking about going through SEER and you're going through this water survival training and stuff like that. Can you explain to the listeners how you ended up going down to AFSOC compared to your guys, you know, everybody else that went to uh, Omaha? Uh, I would. I would like to, I don't know that I can, because at the time, and, and to some extent, even now, I, I don't know why. Um, my So my best friend and I, there were like 12 people in our language class that were in the Air Force, and all but one of them were gonna be airborne. Um, so eight, I guess eight other people all got sent to Omaha, and my best friend and I didn't. And we had like no idea why, our orders dropped, we all knew our orders were coming to this day, we're all just like refreshing on computers, like, you know, over and over and over again. Uh, and he and I get orders that say you're going to Earlbert Field in Florida, and we're just like, what is going on? Um, now, I've, I've talked to him, and he says he thinks now, or somebody told him that he and I both signed six-year contracts, mm. and everybody else had signed four-year contracts. 
And so that was why we got chosen. There was a need, right? AppSoc needed um, the people who thought that AppSoc needed like Afghan languages, mm -hmm. right? Docker was actually useless. Like that's why we had to go back and learn Bosch too. But his understanding was that it was because we had signed six year contracts, um, the training, you know, would take longer and they, they would also have us for longer to do this very specialized, specialized job within a specialized career field. Yeah, especially when you're talking about three years of training. I mean, you almost, it's surprising. <laughs> it's surprising that not everybody has to sign something like that. It's a bummer for the guys that sign six year contracts because they hit that four year mark with everyone they're serving with, and those four year mark guys go away. And mm -hmm. you're like, man, I still got two more years. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I wasn't like that, but I know plenty of guys that got super bummed after all their four year buddies started getting out and they're like, what the fuck did I do? You know? <laughs> no, I, I mean, I'm, I was lucky that like none of my four year buddies were with me. Right. Mm. But yeah, they, almost to a man, they all got out. Yeah. 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 Um, so, I mean, that's cool. I've been down to Hurlburt. Not everybody likes it down in that area, but I was flying out to do some training down there and it's a pretty decent area. I thought, was it weird? For, you're from, you're not too far from there, right? In Florida, you're from that area kind of. I do, so I, I joined the Air Force to get out of Florida and I got stationed like four and a half hours from where I grew up. That's what I was going to say. Like I had a corpsman in my, when I was over at Anglico, he actually lived like 45 minutes north of where we were, of Camp Pendleton. <laughs> and I'm like, that's got to be weird to just be able to go home on the weekends. And like, it's almost like you're living a reserve life because you're seeing your family all the time, but you're still, I don't know. It was, is that weird to be that close to home? Did you take advantage? Did you go home much? So, so I didn't, um, like, I didn't have, well, I mean, Lake City, Florida, like, there's nothing to go home to. Fast food and gas stations, I don't know. That's uh, good stuff, and, man. And still, I think Florida's, like, much bigger than people imagine. Like, it's For a sure. Huge city. Um, so four hours, yeah, you could, I guess you could go home a weekend, but it's like, eh, you have to leave Friday night and you gotta come Sunday morning. So I didn't really, um, I didn't really have an incentive to, I think, like, the middle i was from the middle of florida and like i lived on some of the best beaches in the world like whether you like destin or fort Wall beach or whatever is mm -hmm. you know but like truly some of the best beaches in the world beautiful white sand super like, nice yeah you know, yeah really nice <laughs> so it's like why would i go to lake city you know yeah and it's right there it's on the um i'm out here in california so if you want to get in the ocean you know you could contend with two to six foot waves depending on what day it is you're not really getting that there in the the gulf of mexico and destin um let's talk gunships man so so you get assigned to gunships not something normal for guys in your job at the time can you kind of break us down different types of gunships the different roles on the gunships and then we can get into specifically you were on the whiskey correct uh yeah yeah so i um i got so at AppSoc at the time uh at rover field there were uh ac-130 views with the u-boats okay were, Arguably the most famous gunships. Right? They've been around since now. They're in Call of Duty, like all that stuff. You see in the movies when someone says a gunship in the movie, that's what they're talking about. So that's what I trained on, uh, actually, was was AC with their use. That's what I got qualified on. And I didn't I wound up like cross training to the whiskeys in Afghanistan. But sticking to the U boat, right? So it's a C one thirty, all C one thirties are just cargo planes. That's what they were designed for. Sometime in Nam, some like mad geniuses had this idea. What if we put a howitzer on a plane? And they did that. They took a 105 millimeter howitzer and they stuck it in the side of a C-130 and they said, all right, let's make this work. And then they did and um, guns that big, they can only fire so fast, right? So like whatever the number of rounds per minute is, it's, it's not that many for a 105. So then they said, okay, what if, we, what if we put some smaller guns on there? And then they, so they, over time they stuck a 40 mil uh, Bushmaster and a 25 millimeter Gatling gun on there. So you've got the three side by side sticking up the side of the plane, howitzer, 40 mil, and 25. Um, that takes a lot of people, right? So a gunship crew is like 13, 14 people, um, depending on whether Dizzy was there. So, you know, pilot, co pilot, navigator, uh, flight engineer, you got the sensor operators. So, big thing about a gunship, you know, you get the guns, you can shoot people, but like, how do you find those people? So, you've got the sensor operators. Um, and then you've got a fire control officer, so they're responsible for sort of aiming the guns, managing the guns. Uh, you've got an electronic warfare officer, so that's a historic thing. Like, that was really important in NAM, right? Like, planes got shot down all the time. Then you would want to track sort of incoming surface to air missiles, that sort of thing. And then you've got the gunners in the back, and the gunners, like, physically load the guns, right? Like, the gun, the, the galley, maybe, right? It's belt fed. It kind of doesn't need a lot, but the, the 105, you have to physically like load, reload, load, reload, remove shells, all that kind of stuff. 
Um, and then you have a load master who has to balance the plane because putting all the bullets on a plane makes it pretty weird. Um, and so they're responsible for that. And then you have the, the uh, so Dizzo, direct support operator, linguist is not like required for a gunship to fly mm-hmm. at all. Everybody else I talked about, like, you have to have those people. You can't fly without a flight engineer. You can't fly without a navigator. But you can fly without a Dizzo, for sure. Uh, and plenty of people would prefer to fly without a Dizzo. <laughs> but uh, when, when a Dizzo flies, you're sitting there's a, on a gunship. You can find videos of this online. There's a, it's called the booth. And that's where sort of all the people, basically the you know pilot co-pilots are up front. And then the gunners are in the back. And then everybody else is sort of in the middle in this box. You're sitting in with all the you know various technology that exists yeah yeah it's um it's interesting they um we did some training with them down here one time and they they landed over miramar and let us do a walk around they're really oh. interesting uh yeah they're really interesting aircraft you know to just even be inside it's like wow this is the way it's all set up and everything it's like this is uh just i don't know not normal obviously the closest no. thing <laughs> the closest thing that we have in the marine corps was when they started using the harvest hawks where they took the C-130, put the Griffin missile on it, and put Hellfire missile on it. Um, and those were really, you know, we loved having those on station too. So that was the good thing. And we'll talk about this more because your aircraft was a daytime flying one. That was the thing we liked about having the Harvest Hawk is because you couldn't get any kind of C-130 support during the daytime, the Ace-130 support during the, the daytime. So a Harvest Hawk could come on station and, and sit there and do scans for you and stuff for like three hours. And then own employ ordinance if necessary and stuff. It's not as cool as flying low and shooting the gun and stuff like that. But it's like, in my experience, most of the, of the most of the stuff that happened was during the daytime anyway. So it was more logical for them to be up and providing close air support during that timeline. Um, so let's talk about your role specifically on the aircraft. What are you bringing to the mission why are they bringing you on board? You know, you said some people may not want you guys there. Why is that? Yeah, so uh, the job of a DISO is, is uh, you know, provide threat warning. That's like to the aircraft and to ground personnel. So I always say it, and I still say to this day, that basically I, I worked for you guys. I worked for a JTAC, right? Um, I'm there, you know, to protect the plane. But in the time that I was in Afghanistan, there weren't, you know, real threats. For the most part, like gunships are still not going to fly during the day because big, easy target, fat, you know, mm-hmm. slow. Like, no, and and a gunship got shot down in Iraq for that exact reason of flying during the day, so they stopped doing that. Um, but for the most part, my job is to provide threat warning to people on the ground. So you know, you can um, you're just listening to push to talk right radios, like that's what the Taliban are using. So big fancy walkie talkies, more or less, big battery powered walkie talkies, not dissimilar to a lot of JTAC radios, I think. Yeah. Uh, just not as good, but not dissimilar. Not encrypted, obviously. Yeah, right. And so, yeah, you listen to them and, you know, they talk about all sorts of stuff. The reason maybe some people, right, there was a running joke that, like, a Dizzo is not worth their weight in bullets. Uh, and it's because pretty much every other job on the plane, you can see what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Right? So a gunner, like, physically puts a bullet in a gun. Like, that's really important. The sensors, you know, they're operating their cameras there. What you're talking about, like, you have to find the guys who are shooting at you or planning, you know, nefarious stuff. You can see what a sensor's doing. Poke on that, pilot, everybody, same thing. Like, you, you really understand what they're doing. You look at a, a Dizzo, and it's just, like, a nerdy person with headphones on. <laughs> like, that's what you see. And and it's you can't explain it because you're like, well, yeah, let me explain two years of training to you, and then, like, maybe we'll have a conversation. You know, it's not worth it. And the the... Other thing is that a lot of the time we are not providing like actionable, you know, information because a lot of the time there just isn't any, mm-hmm. right? There's not always firefights. There's not always like bad guys plotting. And so you, you could have whole missions where to the rest of the gunship, they're like, why were you here? And what did you do? You didn't do anything? Um, yeah. Yeah. I, it's funny in 2011, we had a guy, we, we were, I was the uh, fires chief and one day well, I was with three, six at the time. And one day we had the, uh, one of the nets, one of the radio frequencies that we were listening to was a ch- single channel radio frequency that we were using. And it was encrypted on our end and stuff like that. And I'm sitting there and all of a sudden I started hearing, you know, Dari or Pashto or something coming over. And I'm like, what the hell? You know, this is on our net. Like, what the heck is this? And then it stopped for a couple minutes and it came back and I'm like, Hey, we got, what is this? And they brought in some dude I had never seen before on this little fob 
And he's just, some nerd dude come walking in and yeah. sat down and put the headset to his ear and started writing it out and, you know, writing it out in that Arabic, like, uh, whatever, you, however you describe that, uh, kind of writing. And I was just like, who are you, dude? Like, where, where have you been? And it's just some guy locked away somewhere in a closet, just listening to radios all day. I was like, man, that's a crazy job. And then I never saw him again after that. It was pretty interesting. Yeah. So there's, they're ground linguists and they, yeah, that's what they would do. I mean, I have a lot of friends from language school. That's what they did. They go work somewhere and they, they work like 10 hour shifts. Yeah. That's all they do is they sit there and listen and they type out. Yeah. What is that like, man? I mean, just to listen to, I mean, obviously the weird voyeurism of it, right. Of just listening to conversations. You, like you said, not every, there's not gunfights going on all the time. So a lot of these conversations are probably just mundane general mm-hmm. conversations. What did you think about that? Of just hearing such like personal talk from people. Um, it was a, it was a developing thought process. That's for sure. It, it's sort of, it's, it's, it's very strange. Like at first you, because, um, it, at least in the role I was in, right. That my job is to buy threat warning. Like that's what I'm supposed to be doing. And the, the thing that maybe people told me and I just didn't listen because I was young and stupid, or maybe they told me and I just, I couldn't understand it is that like the necessary part of that, of doing the job of providing threat warning is listening to all the mundane stuff mm-hmm. because it, you can have mundane until it's not right. Like everything's good until shit hits the fan and you, but you have to, you, you don't know when that, that peak is going to happen. So you do have to listen to all this stuff. And it was very strange because it is, um, I would be hard pressed to imagine that somebody could do that and not be like, oh, I'm just like listening to people. Because before, you know, if I describe it to maybe even to you or, or other people who did your job, it's like, no, you're like listening to the Taliban. Like, and that's, that's this whole idea. Right? Mm-hmm. They shot at you and like, bad stuff was happening and yeah, they're, they're the bad guys. They're absolutely bad guys. But also when you're listening to them and you're hearing all this like normal conversations, like, Oh, but they're people too. And, and maybe, you know, to people who are smarter than me, that's like, well, duh. But to 22 year old me who had like trained to do this very specific job, it was not the sort of duh thing. It was like, Oh wow, this is a very different thing. When you were in training, you know, I imagine they have some kind of audio tapes or something for you to listen to as like training guides or something or training aids or something like that. Do they include, is it all just military stuff that they introduce you to or is, do they include a lot of just general conversation? Um, so like in language school, right, that's what you're learning is, is there are some, you know, obligatory military lessons. I think this also changes depending on the language you're in. Mm-hmm. So I think that like Russian language school, there's probably a lot of really complicated military stuff because right? they have a, a huge military industrial complex. Afghanistan, not so much. Mm. So, mo- I, you know, 95% of my training is, is like normal stuff. A lot of it becomes the news and, and you know, like reading like economic papers about economics and stuff like this because you have to get really good at the language, mm-hmm. even though you're listening to like really basic stuff. You do listen to some military stuff. The, the things that you're talking about like get really classified. And so that training is... Mm. Um, there's not as much of it. There just like can't be, right? Because you can only listen to it in certain buildings at certain hours of the day with yeah. certain people around and like that sort of stuff. And at least for for what I did, there there was also just less of that because mm-hmm. you know you can imagine if again, if we think about Russia, right? You can record how many thousands of hours of like Russian material, like Russian you know big communication networks do people record? Probably probably quite a lot. Versus, like, if you're recording the Taliban, you're only going to record, like, when they're fighting, right? Like, why would you record dudes asking other dudes about, you know, how's the weather? Yeah. And so you, you yeah, like, and, it, and it's expected that you already know that. Like, the, the the fighting stuff, maybe it's not expected you know, because that's a different type of talking. The way you just, the way you talk on a radio in the middle of a firefight is, like, not English to other people, right? If, if you just took a random civilian For and said, sure. hey, tell me what this guy's talking about, they'd be like, I don't know. <laughs> And so that's stuff that you do have to learn about that. But why would anybody be like, oh, yeah, also, hey, remember, they're going to ask about, like, how's their cousin, how's the weather, how's the road, that sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, would could you, if you, listening to them, listening to conversations all the time, these normal conversations, 
Are they similar to the conversations you would hear if you sat down in the chow hall next to a couple guys that were just BSing, you know, and you overheard that? Is it is it kind of the same vibe, or are they having conversations that you would never even consider? Um, I don't think conversations I would never consider because I'm not, you know, these it's dudes talking over push to talks. I'm not listening to like phone calls or anything, right? So For I'm sure, not to, you know, hugely. I'm never going to hear like full in depth call somebody to like wax philosophic about something like you probably you know call a buddy because something bad happened in your life and i'm like i didn't need to talk about yeah i'm not gonna hear any of that i didn't okay and, uh, but you'll i mean dick jokes for sure right <laughs> <laughs> like dudes are planning an attack and they're making dick jokes absolutely um whining complaining right like i imagine you spent many a cold night in afghanistan well so did they and so they would talk about it like yeah. what else you're gonna do you're bored and freezing your ass off like of course you're gonna talk about it mm -hmm. we had our afghan linguist with us and um he carried a monitor where we would listen or he carried a radio where we would listen to some of the the transmissions back and forth and mm -hmm. it would be crazy because we'd be in like a firefight sometimes and he'd be talking shit to him like in the middle of the firefight and they'd be like, we're going to cut your head off. And he's like, we're going to fucking kill you. You know, like just this weird back and forth. And we're like, dude, stop. Like, what are you doing? Like, you know, that's, that's not helping the situation wild. probably. Yeah. That's crazy. That he, that he, <laughs> he talked back to them. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Cause it was just a regular radio. It was like their, it was like one of their radios and he just had it to listen to. And he would tell us like, um, I remember one thing that, you know, I passed back to, it was like, they're not afraid of like fixed wing aircraft. You know, they're like, Oh, you know, I had a, I had a Harrier coming in to do a, um, a simulated gun run and then do a show of force kind of pass because we couldn't get clearance to drop. And the commander on the radio was like, just hide the trees. They're not actually going to drop. Like they knew we weren't actually going to drop any ordnance. And I was like, man, these fucking guys, you know, it's like, no, no, they're, weird. they're real savvy. Yeah, that's what I always told people. I'm like, don't you know? You, you gotta, you gotta respect what they're doing with what they have. You know, part of it is through brute force. You know, a lot of one thing a lot of people don't realize is a lot of these local Afghans don't care about the Taliban either. You know, when the Taliban shows up, there would be we would we would hear about fights between the local Taliban guys and the international Taliban guys, the guys that would come down from <laughs> Pakistan. Because right. they're coming down and like, why are you guys messing stuff up? You know, you have to give us a house to live in and give us food to eat while we're here. They're like, dude, we're out here fighting every day and singing. Like, what are you, you know, you're coming down from the the good life. <laughs> it's such a weird dynamic when you start hearing that kind of, and that, those other conversations. And you got to hear that all the time, which is crazy. Um, tell us more about it, man. I mean, in the book, your first, your first mission out was a crazy ass firefight. And mm. it sounds like you were just inundated kind of sensory overload from everything that you were hearing. Yeah. I mean, so there's, there's some important context to that. So I was talking about, I was, you know, I was trained on AC-130U gunship and I got to Kandahar and they, um, the MC-130 whiskey doesn't exist anymore. It was at the time they were prototyping the next generation of gunship. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's, you can, this is all, you can go look this up on the internet. Um, it's like the Harvest Hawk. That's right. So it's a sort of roll on, roll off platform. And there's a Griffins on it. So that's what I, they were like, we need people on this because exactly what you were talking about of like daylight, something, not a real gunship per se, but you know, overhead sensors and you can drop some version of ordnance. So I got switched to flying on, on to that. Um, it's flying is in the job I did, like it sort of doesn't really matter to some extent what plane you're on. So it's very quick to just cross train. Mm -hmm. So I got qualified on whiskey and yeah, my first mission was this like huge battle um, that, you know, the numbers are like, 300 Taliban tried to over on a fob and, and it was really, it was a bad day. I mean, six, six Americans died. Um, I think a fair, fair number more got injured and like so many, so many Taliban died. Um, cause we were dropping like just so much, so many rounds, so much, so much, like fighter jets were coming and dropping bombs. It was, it was wild. And it was, yeah, it was absolutely sensory overload, um, where that mission was. So like, without getting super duper nerdy, right? You have language, like you have Pashto as a language, but Pashto in and of itself has dialects. So there's sort of like Eastern and Western Pashto and they, there are like some letters that sound differently. And so whole words will sound different and it's the same word, but like it sounds really weird. And then you get into, you know, like 
Afghanistan is, is like the countryside is wild because you've got these huge mountains and these deep valleys and you could theoretically have like person in Valley A try and talk to person in Valley B and like they don't have huge communication. There's a giant mountain in the way and like so they didn't go back and forth and they like maybe have a hard time understanding each other because they have really weird accents because like language evolves over time in certain locations. So where that mission was, it was really hard to understand dudes. And it was such a giant fight, like 300 Talos, right? Let's say even 10% of them are talking on radios. That's 30 dudes talking all at once, like trying to keep track of that when it's your first time doing your job for real. Um, I'm sure there are people who are much smarter than me who could have done that, right? but I was not one of those people. Mm-hmm. And I, I was flying with an instructor and like together we were sort of overwhelmed. But it, it, it was, at least for us, it was kind of okay because... You know, we were on the whiskey we were during daylight and there was so much going on that, you know, everybody else was doing all the, the bombing and the shooting and all that kind of stuff. That fortunately, you know, it wasn't that like I got somebody killed or something because I couldn't do my job that day. So in a situation, maybe not like that, maybe one that's less hectic, are you listening to them go, hey, we're going to move to the west? Hey, we're going to attack from the east? Is that kind of the general sense of what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're basically doing, you know, uh, in, in, in a tick, so like troops in combat or just a firefight, whatever. Yeah, they're doing general, just like field battle communication of, yeah, move move up, like the Americans are to the east, like, so we need to go that way, or, hey, bring the gun, like, they, you know, um, you know where Dushka is, mm-hmm. just a big-ass fucking gun. And there aren't that many of them, but when one shows up, it's a bad day like for you and for you know to pick guys um and so they would say hey you know we're getting that like there's one that was you know two miles away we got to bring it in or something like that or it's you know hidden somewhere in this village we got to get it out or you know calling for reinforcements or being like we're gonna we're gonna move around this way or you know we've got other guys that are waiting over at this place that sort of thing have you do you i mean so it sounds like you're like getting called in like on the spot for different situations rather than long term i'm not maybe and i'm only about halfway through the book so it could be farther into it but do you get to know anyone like by listening to the same conversations over same people over and over again or is it always different you know every time it's it's pretty much in my role it's pretty much always different so yeah because i would the whiskey ops and gunship ops just in general or sort of yeah somebody planned a raid you talk about gunship op at night like you guys are going to go raid some village or whatever. Okay, cool. Gunship gets tasked to that for that night. Big, big stuff. Like maybe you know like a week ahead of time where you're going. Maybe. But usually it's sort of day to day. Or even like I had plenty of missions where we were on, you know, op A. And a, a tick opened up 100 miles away. Well, 100 miles in the area isn't that far. So we would just be like, all right, bye. We're done with that. We're going over here. So for me, it was, no, I, I didn't really ever like hear the same dudes talking Hmm. Okay. Did when, you know, you're going in for a raid, I imagine you guys are coming on station before obviously the raid touches down, the raid force touches down. Is it kind of crazy to listen to maybe no conversation or light conversation and then hear it ramp up as they realize what's going on? Yeah. So, I mean, night versus day is like the cliche that different because during the day, right, you could, people are doing all kinds of stuff. People are just talking about shit. Mm-hmm. They, got, they got life planes and they're doing stuff at night at three o'clock in the morning. If you're talking on the radio, probably doing something a little shady. Um, and yeah, they, they, you know, because I'm even on a, a U boat or a normal gunship, right? You're still like 10,000 feet up. So, like, the cone of what you could listen to is fairly large. Um, so, you'd get, you know, some bullshitting or whatever, like guys complaining about the cold. Um, but then you'd also, you know, if you're really over at a map, you're like, okay, I'm going to try and find here and there. Sometimes they're like truly, yeah, they're absolutely unsuspecting. They're just like, talking about whatever, doing their check-ins. They're like, oh, I, I hear something. You know, I hear a plane coming in, but who knows what is going to happen. And then next thing they know, doors are getting kicked in or even better, you know, well, better for us, worse for them. <laughs> uh, it was planned out and they knew, you know, you guys knew you were going to be resistant. So these dudes are just hanging out and then the gunship just lays down 40 mil. Yeah, and then, then everything goes wild. It's always been kind of a weird – for me, it's weird for to imagine like air crews that go out and do work in a combat environment and then just come home, land, and then like, oh, let's go to Green Bean and get a coffee. Like it becomes like a super chill almost environment. 
you know, whereas like an infantry guy, a lot of times they're out at a fob or a patrol base somewhere living in the mud. And that's kind of their life for the next seven months to a year. Mm. It's a, it, is it weird to come back to almost not comforts of home, but you know, not a really bad living situation, like going out and hearing these like crazy combat events and coming back and being like, all right, let's go to the chow hall, you know? Oh yeah. I and mean, that's what we do, dude. Better yet. It's like you, you wake up, you go get breakfast, no matter what time of day it is, who cares? Eat breakfast, you go fly, you come back and yeah, it's dinner time. We're like, I'm going to come back. Oh, I got to go to the gym. I got to lift. Like, at the time, I, I sort of never, I didn't know anybody who thought about it because it's just like, you know, humans are really good at getting accustomed to whatever it is, whatever environment they're in. Mm-hmm. Um, but absolutely comfort. It's like, I'm coming, I'm not sleeping in the mud. I'm sleeping in a freight container here with air conditioning in the summer and like Wi Fi. And yeah, I got to walk a quarter mile to the chow. Oh, like, la di da. Those walks were the worst, though. <laughs> they are. But, <laughs> but yeah, look now, yes, it's very strange. And I mean, the thing that blows my mind and, and, You'll, I talk about it later in the book, later than where you are right now, is like drone operators doing that because yeah. those guys and, and women are dropping, like potentially dropping missiles on dudes and then like driving home to have dinner with their family. Mm-hmm. And that is absolutely bananas to me. I was just talking to somebody about that the other day. I was like, that's just such a crazy, it's got to be surreal. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. you, how can you not? how can you not bring some of that home with you? Especially if it's, if, if it's a clean drop, if it's a good drop, I know this dude's a bad guy, whatever, man, that mm-hmm. shit like that's not going to bother you, but it does happen where there's collateral damage or something happened. Something didn't go the right way. And if you're in country, you have, you know, you're in country, you can deal with it in country. There's like debriefs. We can maybe lessons learn, maybe whatever, talk it out. When you're doing that and then leaving the base at the end of the day, you're back in the real world, unclassified world, you know, Las Vegas or wherever. I don't know, man. It's so surreal to even think like, I don't know. It's, it's crazy. It's, it's, I hate to like compare it to playing video games, but it's almost like fucking playing video games. But the guy on the other end isn't a character in a video game. You know what I'm saying? It's so crazy. I had, you know, because right. So like I played call of duty while I was training on a gunship. Like, not, like, at the same time, right? But I would, like, fly, and I had to do so many flights in my training, and, like, there's days in between. And I'm, like, hanging out in my dorm, playing Call of Duty with my buddies. And the screen, when you, there's, like, gunship missions in Call of Duty, the video game, it looks exactly like a gunship, right? It looks like what the sensors see, because it's really old, outdated technology. It's just, like, black and white TV screen. Yeah. You're on a gunship, and that's what you see, like, in real life. So like yeah, it, it is like a video game because like there are video games that have mimicked real life. Yeah, and I, for the for the the people who are doing drone stuff, man, you said like surreal. I have a pretty significant suspicion that it's like unreal that they like because I have a friend who who did similar work, and it sort of seems like no, you're like you're really separated from reality. Like it creates yeah. a, a true break in it because that has to be reality a. And your life has to be reality B because exactly what you said, like, I guess the only way I put it is like, otherwise you'd be bringing violence home. And it's not like you can bring it home and talk about it. No. And you definitely, those those (laughs) people, everything they're doing, like we, I did stuff, right. I got to write a book about it. And you just thought like, we can talk about this a lot. Like not everything, obviously, but plenty of it. I don't think a single drone operator could write a book like legally. Right. So how are they supposed to talk about it? Yeah, man, it's so wild. It's like, um, you know, there's probably people, though, that doesn't bother at all. They're like, that's just what it is. I go to work and that's work. But there's definitely got to be people. It's probably kind of like if you are one of the nuke officers, the nuclear officers, you got the keys for the actual nuke and you're sitting underground. And it's like, is this real life, man? Like, we're just sitting here like, what if I actually got the phone call to push the button? You know, like, wait, what? You know, it's it's got to be somewhat surreal to kind of be in that position every day. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think a lot of it, like definitely for me, you know, early in my deployments and stuff, um, the the training is over is able to like override that sort of, and and I think at least I can't speak to being drone operator because I didn't do it, but at least like while you're working, you know, it's it's real high stakes. Like mm. I I had a mission where JTAC got shot, and like that was awful, and so I can't I can't really have that going on. 
like if that's what's going on so much, like I can't, I shouldn't be doing my job. I'm like I should quit doing my job. The the word the harder significantly harder thing is that yeah, when you get home, well, there there aren't stakes to stop you from thinking. There's nothing that's going to prevent you. You don't have like some greater obligation. You maybe you know your family, loved ones, and all that, but your day to day interaction with your family, like that's not as high stakes as the firefight. Yeah. So how are you supposed to like choose that or prioritize that or something? Yeah. So, dude, that's such a thing that I tell people all the time. And I'm like, when you get out, if you had a, if you had like for me being a JTAC, being in a combat arms job where even in training things can go wrong, it's like could be life and death stuff. Like even in training, if someone drops a bomb wrong, I, my very first field op as an artillery observer, they shot a, they shot a 155 round and it landed 50 meters from me. You know what I'm saying? So it's an inherently dangerous job on accident. They put half the powder in the gun that they were supposed to. This was the check round that was supposed to determine that they were safe to continue shooting. So, it, <laughs> so right. yeah. it, when you leave a job like that, it was really hard for me to care really about anything because I'm like, it's not life or death. Like this doesn't really matter. Like, yeah, whatever, you know, cause you're used to like, I won't say care about anything, but a lot of things become like, whatever, man. Which is also a good thing because I don't let little things bother me. Right. But I also don't let big things that probably should bother me bother me. You right. Know what I'm saying? I, you'll get to it later in the book, but like a guy I worked with, you know, he said to me once, no problem that anybody has is worse than any mission I was ever on. But hands fucking down. There's no way what's going on in your life is as bad as a bad op in Afghanistan. And like, may, maybe that's not 100% true, right? Maybe, you know, your wife and kids die in a plane accident, okay, car accident. Like, okay, there, there are, right, the, the spirit of that, of what he said, I think does hold true. Like, yeah, like, how am I, like, why would I give a flying fuck about the bad day that you had? <laughs> what am I, and you, I, I, I had to, and a lot of people I know have had to learn, you know, Re relearn how to care about those sorts of things, or like unlearn how to not care about those sorts of things. Yeah. No, it's but, that's a go ahead, go ahead. Oh uh, yeah, the, the I so I went to um, I went to Columbia after I got out to study biology, and like Columbia is real hard, real rigorous university, and you know people would ask me, well, you're I'm in it's it's completely integrated, so like there are there's technically a school that has like veterans in it, but we take all the same classes as the normal undergrads. So I'm taking classes with like 19 year olds. People be like, man, like how do you you know put up with them? Like because they're they're truly whining about exams and stuff. And eventually the conclusion I came to that has helped me a lot, and if it can help anybody else, you know, is like on some sort of objective level, yes, like you having a 155 millimeter bullet laying 50 meters from you is far more stressful than any test any kid is taking. But also, like, you experience this amount of stress from that bullet falling. This 19-year-old is experiencing the same amount of stress mm -hmm. from this. Event. Like, they, abs they, they absolutely are because that is the most stressful event in their life. For sure. And that was the thing that allowed me to be, like, to, per to offer some grace, I guess. Yeah, I think I heard that on Joe Rogan. They were talking one time, or I think he said it a couple times. He said something like... Um... The most stressful thing you've ever done is still the most stressful thing you've ever done. Doesn't matter right. in right. context with other people, you know, that's the most stressful. Like crossing a street as a kid can be stressful. You know, if you're a little kid and you've never really crossed it on your own and kind of deal because you're looking, thinking you're going to get ran over. That's what your mom and dad told you. <laughs> uh, you know, like, yeah, yeah, you know, you're hundred percent right. I, and one thing for me was going to school afterwards. I had to kind of, kind of come to the realization or not realization just and these kids haven't lived life yet you know like you can't judge them for not understanding or having a, a slanted viewpoint because they've never done anything they're all they've come straight from high school now they're in college everything they're being taught is second you know secondhand knowledge third hand knowledge from other people they haven't a lot of them haven't got out and experienced life yet you know um and that's what i always tried to like I just, I've told the story before, I think, but there's, there was this girl in my class who was like, man, I was in Italian. I was taking Italian when I got out. Horrible idea. Um, <laughs> she was like, oh, the, you, you know, the, there's no culture in the U S and I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, there's tons of culture. Like, it sounds like you haven't traveled any, like, 
quit letting people tell you there's no culture in the US, you know, or no culture here and there. Like, look at everything that we have, you know, look at look at the United States as a whole. There's so many different regions and, you know, people, the way people talk, the way people eat, the way people live, dance, listen to music. You know, it's just, that's just such a bad thing. And it wasn't like I, I wasn't mad at her. And I just kind of, ex- I made my point that way is kind of like explaining. Cause I know she's never been anywhere. You know, she's only regurgitating what her friends and what teachers and stuff have told her. There's no culture in the U S well, that's a lie, you know? Um, so yeah, one thing I got was just understand that they haven't lived yet, you know? And, and also a big thing I always tell people too, is like, if you were in some shitty stuff overseas, do you really want people to understand that to be able to understand that, you know, like why would you want to bring that kind of stress into anyone you like love or whatever's life, you know, cause that's, it can be pretty heavy. Yeah. I mean, I, there, I think that there's some merit to like letting people know conceptually that those things happened. Right. Yeah. Cause, cause I, I do think that, there are ways that I'm going to respond to things or ways that you were going to respond to things or a way that, you know, an infantry guy are going to respond to things that are rightfully quite different from how the vast majority of people in America are going to respond to things. And I like, there should be some sort of leeway there. Like, yeah, well, we're responding for a very good reason. Like we have good reasons for that, but I, yeah, like the, like my, I have friends who are going to read this book who I've been friends with for 10 years who know nothing of it. They don't know any of the stories in it because I've never told them. Mm-hmm. It's like, why? yeah, I, I explicitly write about this. Like, why would I, why would I share my insert negative emotion of choice, be it anger or sadness or grief or whatever? Like, you, you can't do anything about it. So why am I going to give it to you? Yeah, yeah, you don't need to share that burden. Yeah, yeah I, I've come to a different conclusion. I, I have come to the conclusion that. Um, somehow you you do need to find a way to not share the burden because I still don't want to give it to anybody. I think you're 100% right. Like, I don't want to give that negative stuff to people. But I think that we, as, like, possessors of that negativity, also can't be responsible for holding on to it completely. Mm. Like, I think that that's a huge problem, right? It has been since World War II. It still is to some extent today that, like, yeah, like this is my, you know, my burden to bear, my load, my cost to carry, whatever, that sort of thing. Sort of, but like, you, you got to be able to get stuff out there. Yeah, there's got to be an outlet for sure. There's got to be an outlet. That's why I like when guys write books, guys start podcasts, you know, mm-hmm. people write blogs, people do artwork, whatever it is. You know, I think a creative outlet is really important for people, especially as you get older and stuff like that. You know, uh, it's just something to help. I don't know, be an outlet, you know, just like let that, let all that energy of whatever you're feeling into whatever it is you're working on. I've had multiple people that have come on the podcast that are like, dude, it was so great. You know, stuff I haven't talked about in forever. Um, And they're like, memories are getting stirred up and stuff because of different things. And I'm like, yeah, dude, it's when you're not, it's so weird. People that are still in won't, won't get it until they're out. But when you're in and you're like talking to people every day and you're in the same job field and stuff, especially you're having these conversations and it's just like you're talking or whatever. When you get out, you're, especially if you go back to your hometown, you're immediately separated from all of that. You're back. It's almost like a time machine. You're going to go back in time to where you were before you join. And no one there will understand what you're talking about at all. You know? And that's why you got to find another way to like have an outlet. If you can't, if you don't have anybody within your community that, you know, understands, then you got to like, I don't know. Find something, find a VFW, find an American Legion or something to join. You know, there's always old timers there telling stories, write a book, do a podcast. But yeah, man, I think it's important for people to share their stories. I've, I've been enjoying having people on the show because I think it's a good, it's a good record of people's service that will never be in history books, you know, cause it's always major stuff that's in history books and generals and stuff like that. But the individual person's perspective on what they did. And it also, I believe, is educating the general public on what actually happens in the military. Like if a recruiter calls me and says, I want to be, you know, they need a radio operator. They want radio operators. Well, what does that even mean? You know, like 
that's I may have the understanding kind of in my head, like what is a radio operator, but to actually hear from someone that was a radio operator, what they did in country in the U S whatever I think is invaluable. But I mean, I think it's super cool too, that you, you can get so many people from, you know, special operations, special forces communities. Cause that stuff is all, it's all movies, right? It's like, everything's going to be glamorized or, or just changed for the most part. Yeah. And it, it's, it's, super cool that you can get those stories that are are very true and like not everyone yeah not everyone did black hawk down okay (laughs) still did a lot of crazy stuff that isn't going to be you know talked about you know and everybody did their part if they were in the military i hated it as a mechanic i was miserable and they had to let us know like in iraq like look here's what you're doing you know, you guys are doing good work. Like they need, you're fixing the armor on the vehicles. You're doing this, you're doing that. Like this is stuff being used, but it feels like you're not doing anything because you're not like in the fight or whatever. So it's, uh, man, I hated that. Um, I don't know. I was miserable when I did that. And I don't know what my point was. We were talking about, we were talking about having people on. Oh, my point was, Everybody has a part. So even as a mechanic, even though I hated it and I didn't understand the big picture of like what we were doing and how it was, you know, helping shape the battlefield or whatever, you know, I don't know. You got to come to the realization that even if you weren't in combat, you you had a part in it. You know, you had a part in like the mission, I guess. Um, yeah. yeah I mean, you, you are contributing to like a, a cause greater than you, like whatever that cause might be. If you want to get super, super meta about it, right. With like, defense of america <laughs> or if you just even like yeah. there are dudes who are rolling out in mraps like they need good functioning armor on that or bad stuff happens to them yeah for sure yeah it's i don't know it's but yeah like we were talking before like we we're saying just for people finding it find an outlet you know to express yourselves yeah. and kind of let things out you know you got to have a decompression valve to to let some of the steam off and that outlet maybe just calling a buddy that you served with someone that you haven't talked to in a while and just kind of catching up seeing how they're doing and it's weird when you call someone that you served with because it's almost like you, it's almost like almost no time has passed you know mm-hmm. the lingo comes back the harassment about you or your buddy or something that happened one time comes back you know i don't know if you've experienced that or not since you've been out Oh, it, yeah, I keep saying this, and hopefully it's not repetitive, but, like, 100% of that exact sentiment is in the book, like, talking about that. Because I, I called people to be like, did I remember this right? Like, I, am I saying this right? Like, is this true? Or, or what you remember, too? And I think even, too, so so I, I went to school after I got out, and I, I went to medical school um, after, after that, and there are not, you know, very many veteran positions, I think, it's, a lot of it's just like time like you did this thing in the military for a long time and like the road to med school is a very long road and like why would you do both of those unless you're stupid and stubborn like me um but there was a guy who's a year above me who was a corpsman in the navy and he he was a very he's a really good dude and he you know i found out there were a couple of other veterans in my med school class um but i happen to be the only one who you know deployed saw any semblance of combat and he had been deployed he'd been attached to marines uh, in Afghanistan and within probably three minutes of meeting where you know making like I'm making fun of him for being the Navy he's making fun of me for being in the chair force like never seen this man in my life never met him before he's five six seven years older than me a year above me in med school like we're not from the same places we didn't join for the same reasons but instant sort of camaraderie yeah oh so, yeah cool cool no we, we we have this thing that like the other people who were, you know, we, we all had gone to a dinner. These other people were in the military, but they did very different things, um, very specialized things. Like someone was in band and, you know, that's sort of widely different from what we did. And even from them, we had, a, a, you know, a separate level of camaraderie. We had some with them, but we had even this much closer one with us. Yeah. And I, I think that, like, I'm hopeful that, you know, there's so many bad things about COVID, but huge upside of it is that like things like this exist that you know you and i are in different time zones different places thousands hundreds of miles apart hopefully more people can find that sort of thing to find that community if it's not you know local to them yeah yeah 100 percent for sure um let's talk about when when you're writing the book you know mm-hmm. you're pretty you're pretty honest in it you, you know you're not afraid to like call it you know hey this person was a dick this guy did this you know not like 
accusatory or anything, but kind of to give a more context, I guess, into their personality or something like that. Did you find that hard to be honest in your writing when you're talking, maybe not in the best light about, you know, some of your fellow people that you worked with? No, I mean, everyone's name has changed. Um, I think like the, there are like 30 people in the world who could identify some of these people. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, I think if they were like public facing personalities, I might've felt different about it, but also to some extent, it's, it, it's my recollection. It's not necessarily true that this person's a dick. Like I felt that they were a dick. And like also, but I was 22 and like I was a dick. So okay, just different, you know, personalities. Yeah. Class. I, I I think I'm pretty careful to not, you know, say objectively this person is bad. And like you should dislike this person. It's just like no, this is how I interact with them. And I don't I don't I don't think there's a harm in that. And I think, you know, saying that there is a harm in that, I'm not saying that you're saying that, but like conceptually other people have been like, oh, how could you say that about that person? Like, well, it's just like human interaction. Like that's mm -hmm. like everybody and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just, it's for me, it's interesting. And um, again, I think you're right. I think everything you just said is correct. It, for me, it's interesting because in normal human, human interaction, you wouldn't go up to someone and be like, this guy kind of a dick. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? But Oh, right. These are people that you know. Did you ever have? Did you have anyone reach out and be like, "Hey, man, what the fuck? What do you?" I mean, you said you talked to a lot of them anyway to make sure the stories were pretty accurate. But, I mean, it has the book hasn't as, as we are talking. The book hasn't come out yet, right? So. Oh, um, that's true. Yeah, I forgot. I yeah, so no, no one has reached out. I, maybe they will. Maybe they won't. I don't know. Um, if they do, I'm going to say what I just said, which is like, just my opinion. Like things change. Like if there's a whole legal team at Simon Schuster that you know read it and you know, make sure I wasn't libeling anybody or anything like that. So for anybody that wants to get out and maybe write a book or something like that, what advice do you give them? I mean, you're hooked up with Simon and Schuster, which is a legitimate publishing company. How do you, how do you make those kind of connections? How do you move forward with writing? You know, give us some insight there. So in my case, it's like some initiative on my part and then a, like a big old cascade of luck. Um, I, the book exists because I did, I wrote an essay that I sent to the Atlantic um, a couple of years ago when sort of the Taliban was taking back Afghanistan and it was leading up to our withdrawal, right? Which was, like, I don't care about anyone's politics. The withdrawal was a shit show right? for, for many reasons, for many people's faults, like all kinds of stuff went wrong there. That's for sure. Um, I wasn't necessarily interested and I didn't write about like the fact of the withdrawal and like all the ways that it was bungled. But I was I was writing about like the Taliban taking back Afghanistan and that, you know, 10 years ago when, when you and I were there in the same year in 2011. Like, I, it's different for linguists, but everyone I worked with knew that that was going to happen. Right. And so as it was happening in the months leading up to that, um, I, I had a lot of feelings about this and I had a lot of feelings about my feelings about this. And I think what you said earlier is very, very true that like outlet like etymologically, like getting it out of you. For me, the only way that I could do that was to physically write it. So I, I just wrote this sort of essay truly to just like get a handle on my feelings. And as I wrote it, I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe other people could benefit from this. Um, so I, I was very, very lucky and very grateful to a couple of professors I had from med school who, who write. One of them is a writing professor. One of them is a physician who writes. They helped me edit it. And I sent it into the Atlantic and the Atlantic was kind enough to, to publish it. Um, so that, that is the advice I would have is like initiative. If you, if you have a story that, you know, unfortunately it's usually a story that other people haven't heard. I think that's a large reason, like why my story was published and like why it was as successful as it was. Cause how many people have ever heard of an airborne linguist, right? Mm -hmm. Not that many, but e even if that's not the case, even if, you know, you did a, a normal, right. Or a less sexy job or whatever. I do think that if you have something to say about it that other people haven't heard, I think that taking the initiative to try and um, get that into a cohesive story is very good. And then after that, for me, it was luck, right? So I, this article got published in the Atlantic. Um, it sort of, you know, like went viral, whatever that means. And um, I've got uh, another writer, his name's Kevin Maurer. He he's like a he co-wrote um, No Easy Day. Mm, yeah story about the Bin Laden mission, you know? So he read the article and he called his agent, his literary agent, and he said, hey, you should you should find this guy. So that my now agent found me and called me and he called me on a Friday or something and he said, hey, you're thinking about writing a book? 
And I said, absolutely not. I have not thought about writing a book once in my life. Um, not this book. And uh, he said, you should think about writing a book. And I said, uh, let, me, let me think about it. And I, I thought about it and talked to my partner and she was very supportive. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll write the book. Um, and then I said, you know, how do I write a book? And he said, nah, you'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. He was right. Um, right. I think, again, just getting, yeah, I think potentially a lot of people write the idea of sitting down and writing a book. Like if you say it's a book, that that is like this big, scary thing. It's really hard. And like that makes you a writer and like all that stuff. Um, I think sitting down and telling a story, most people I know who are in the military pretty good at telling stories because like that's what you do you're hanging out if you're in yeah. training on casuals and you just you know shoot the shit if you're in afghanistan and you're cold and it's night and you're telling stories with your buddies to just like be entertained if you're on a plane you're doing it you know you come back and you talk about the good old times like i think that sitting down and, and telling a story is a far more approachable way to think about it no yeah i, I agree i think that's that's interesting. And with the mindset too, that not every story has to be written into a full book or has to get printed. Of course not. You know, yeah. this could be a story you tell for yourself. If, if for the people listening and you're considering something like this, even if you don't want it to get printed, maybe it's something you write up and then one day someone finds it or whatever, you know what I'm saying? That's your, that's your story, but that's cool, man. What that is good luck. You know, that There's like all, I mean, huge huge amount of luck yeah how do you even reach out to the atlantic did you have a contact there or did you just cold call like hey i got this story boom they they have um like they have they call them desks so they have like a politics desk and a culture desk or everything this ideas desk mm-hmm. uh, it's just an email like i think it's ideas at the atlantic.com or something like that and they take they take cold submissions yeah wow that's awesome man that's really cool um and for that, to, that's exactly what happens, though, is you get into something like the Atlantic and then mm-hmm. you have all these people that are in the professional world that are in that world, read the Atlantic and see it and go, oh, hey, you know, this, there, there's something more to this. Yeah. Right. What you mentioned earlier about the Taliban taking over, I remember we were we I was an advisor in 2013 in Sangin, and we were the last advisor team in Sangin. And mm-hmm. when we pulled out a couple months after we pulled out the infantry unit that was there pulled out and it was supposed to be just the A and a and within like six months or a year of us leaving, it was taken back over. One of my buddies sent me a YouTube video that showed like the, uh, bizarre area was just barren, you know, nothing. It was just, the whole area was just dead when before it was like shops and people doing things and just all, just all kinds of stuff. And I was like, man, so I think when Afghanistan, the withdrawal happened, I wasn't as surprised as a lot of people were. You know, I was like, that's what you think was going to happen. You know, I remember being on Twitter <laughs> and they were like, hey, we think the military can last five months. Uh, the Afghan National Army can, will be able to last five months. I was like, they're not going to last five days. And it was literally like three days later, the whole shit had just collapsed. And I was like, that's what do you expect with the level of uh abuse you know soldiers not getting food you're talking about if a taliban group rolls into a patrol base an afghan patrol base and all those dudes each have one magazine of ammo and not a lot of food and they say you can either turn over you know join us or we're going to kill you all what do you think they're going to do you know like they're a rational decision (laughs) yeah they're not properly and they're not properly outfitted they're not properly supplied and all that comes down to corruption. We sent plenty of money over there, but where that money went, you know, for whatever reason, our politicians and our diplomats and stuff set the tone of accepting a certain level of corruption from the Afghan people because it was a part of their culture. You know, they would say, this is an Afghan solution to an Afghan problem. Yeah, 10% of the soldiers on this roster are ghost soldiers, meaning they don't exist. That pay is going into someone's pocket. But if we don't do that, then we're not going to have a commander. Blah, blah. It's like, okay, well, we're setting a base of corruption. <laughs> do we? Ex- what do we expect is going to happen? So it was very unfortunate what happened during the withdrawal. It was ridiculous. The withdrawal, trying to withdraw from a city rather than a fortified base was fucking dumb. Um, and then I had on a guy, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he was a contractor for the State Department. And he showed up, he got a gig as a medic like a week before the withdrawal happened. And he said he showed up and everyone at the State Department in Kabul was all like, 
business as usual. He's like, do you guys, he just came from the U.S. where he's watching the news. And he's like, do you guys know, know what's going on? He's like, there's still work requests being put for painting walls and doing all this stuff. And then all of a sudden it's like a switch flipped at the last minute. And they're like, mm. bring in the sledgehammers. We got to break the, la- you know, break the computers and stuff. And it's like, I don't know. When you hear about that level of incompetence, it's it's very infuriating. Like it we, we knew it was going to happen, but it didn't have to be as bad as it was. You know? I mean, Again, like the politics that are for people different from and smarter than me, but I probably my best guess is that so much of it has to be just like weird sunk cost fallacy. Like, yeah, we were there for twenty years, and it's like if you're not telling yourself that you know business as usual, like I, I'm contributing to this goal, whatever that goal is. Um, like, how could you stand to be there? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so so much of it, I. It, has to have come down to like, well, yeah, we already put in all this effort, just just a little bit more. That's surely going to fix the problem. So much money, so much money wasted. I remember they spent when I was in Marja in 2011. They spent like half a million dollars to build some kind of like fruit stand or something. Basically, <laughs> another like little stalls for them to sell fresh fresh produce and shit. And it was like the worst construction you could ever imagine, you know. And then. Another thing they spent money on was building a computer cafe, an internet cafe at the bazaar in Marja. Mm. And um, so people could access the internet. And within a week of it opening, I want to say it was only a couple days, but I'll say within a week of it opening, the Taliban put an RPG into it. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? I'm like, God, it's crazy, dude. It's such a crazy world over there. People, I don't know. It's hard to explain. You know, and it's got to, again, I'll come back to it. It's got to be so much different for you because you have a whole other like aspect of understanding of what was going on. Cause you're actually hearing the people talk most Marines right. or whatever is going to be like, fuck the Taliban, you know, like, uh, but they've never actually heard them talk or say anything ever. You know, they're right. just told those are the bad guys. And I don't disagree with that, but those are the bad guys. And that's really the only information they got. They're there. They're bad. Go get them. You're listening to just the mundane conversations and the radio calls and stuff. I mean, just such a trip, you know? Yeah. And and I mean, this is going to be very cliche coming from someone who tries to write for a living, but I I do also read a lot. And I, there's, um, yeah, you can't, my job doesn't exist anymore when it did. Not that many people could do it. Like there's no way to do what I did. If you read my book, maybe that's helpful, but there are other books like, um, there's a book called no good men amongst the living, uh, by Anand Gopal that is like very insightful. He, he is a journalist who he's, he's a wild story. He just like basically showed up in Afghanistan, not as a trained journalist and like over time learned Dari, learned Pashtu and somehow oh, wow. got way into just like hanging out with Taliban. And so he, he it's told through multiple viewpoints of stories, but I want to say it came out in 2011. He was there in like the late 2000s, just like looking at the corruption and like, some of it is, yeah, just people being shitty. I mean, then some of it, like, makes sense of there's no other way to earn a living here because there's a war happening all the time. So, like, yeah, I'm going to take money from people. How else am I going to get by? Yeah. Or, you know, like, we did a lot of good stuff in Afghanistan. Sure, we did a lot of bad stuff. We, like, you know, we're listed, like, members of the Taliban were, being, were coming to us and being informers and saying, like, oh, yeah, this guy's bad. And then if you go and look at the history, oh, interesting, that guy was, you know, that guy's political enemy, but, like, we had hopped on to, like, that that guy's telling us stuff, right? So, and then we torture that guy, and, like, then that guy's like, well, fuck the U.S. Well, sure, like, that's a reasonable response to that. And and it's not about, like, trying to say, like, what about these how are good guys? They're not the good guys. They're the bad guys. But there is a lot of, a lot of, a ton of history and, like, a ton of context, and there are a few um, very good books that, that, can offer some insight into that. Yeah. I, you know, man, I've thought about it before. I said something to somebody. I was like, what if I had a Taliban guy come on the podcast? You know, I was like, that would be an interesting, that could be either completely ridiculous where they're just spouting craziness the entire time or have like an actual discussion between, you know, two people that were yeah fighting I mean, a fight. That, I don't know if that would happen. Yeah. Things like that have happened in history. So like, there was recently, Anand Gopal was part of this too. There was a, um, I want to say it was on New Yorker. They got like a 15 minute video inside of a, a like a Sharia court. Mm. 
and it's like that's never been done like at least in the west or whatever and yeah. it's also better and stuff like that but it yeah like seeing seeing the other world when you're not busy trying to fight it which like i totally you know hey cool someone's trying to kill you neat kill them back um but like seeing some aspect of that uh, i think can be very very illuminating it's it, the idea only came up because I've literally had multiple comments on Instagram and YouTube of guys who are like of Taliban guys that are like, Oh, I was in that fight. Oh, I remember that fucking IED or whatever. Like, Oh, do you remember us when we attacked this? And I'm like, man, that's crazy. They're like watching my videos. That's weird. And then I'm like, well, maybe, you know, I don't, obviously I don't agree with them and stuff like that, but it would be interesting just to kind of get their perspective. You know, what was the fight for you? And then I guess it would probably be different if you talk to somebody from Afghanistan compared to somebody from, like, Pakistan that were fighting in the name yeah. of the Taliban or something. Yeah, I mean, if you, yeah, probably the guys in Pakistan are, like, going to be not so great to talk to. Probably a little more diehard. Yeah, very, very ideological. But there are plenty of, you know, members, members of the Taliban who are, like, they got coerced into it, right? Because, like, the, the Pakistani Taliban showed up and was like, hey, we're taking all your opium. That's the only way you know how to make money. Cool. We're taking all your pomegranates. That's the only way you know how to make money. We're kidnapping your, you know, cousin because, like, whatever. Mm-hmm. So join us or things get worse. Well, okay. <laughs> I guess I, I'll do that one, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, then, and then those guys would have been in fights. And, like, yeah, that'd be fascinating, man. I mean... It- it's, it may be like people hearing this may be like, what the fuck is he talking about? But think of now um, U S vets are going back to Vietnam and seeing and talking yeah. to the guys yeah. that they fought with and seeing the battle battlefields today. Yeah. You know, this isn't like some crazy th- I don't know. I don't know if I'll ever actually do it, but that was something I was like, after I saw a couple comments from these Talib dudes, I was like, huh, I wonder if any of them are coherent enough to do an interview, but that could probably, I don't know. That may ruin me. <laughs> I think it canceled off of everything real fast. Yeah. Yeah. Especially with what's going on in the world today, man, who knows what could be, who, who yeah. you know, could be said, like, you're probably going to get tied into some other uh, rampant ideologies. It's bad timing. I just saw a, uh, I just saw an article this morning that was saying, uh, it was a time magazine. Um, talking about how in Ukraine they're getting upset about like not getting as much funding now there's mm-hmm. because there's more corruption being exposed and stuff like that. And now like a lot of shift is going over to this whole Israel Hamas Gaza thing. Um, I don't know, man, it's such a wild world. Like I sometimes wonder like, what would I be doing right now if I was still in, you know, do you ever have, ever have those thoughts? I, I sort of don't, I think just because what I did was so specialized, right? Like what, if I was still in right now, I'm doing nothing, like jack all, right? I'm gonna help other people, I guess, because because I how would I be useful in Ukraine or in Israel or in um, you know people immigrating from South America or in other humanitarian like I, yeah I I don't think about it just because I like I would be useless, but for yeah guys like you, it's like are you potentially gonna go train Ukrainian army? <laughs> like that'd be wild. Yeah. That's a rough show over there, man. I know guys that have talked about going over. I'm like, dude, fuck that. Like that does not, I don't know. Nothing good. It didn't sound like anything's good coming out of that, you know, trying to go over there. I get guys. I kind of get it. I don't fully, but I kind of get people that were in the military and never deployed to combat or guys that didn't join the military and kind of always regretted it. And they volunteer to go over to do something like that. Cause they're trying to fulfill some kind of, I don't know, fantasy or whatever it is they thought they should have done in their time, you know, do that, that thing. But I'm sure many of them quickly realize that it's not a fucking game and it's not right. like, like, what am I doing here? You know, what am I fighting for? Like, I don't know. It's a tough call, man. I would be upset if I was in right now and I got sent to Ukraine and be like, yeah, I mean, I get it, but what's the end state here? Cause just, I think a lot of us, you know, global war on terror vets can attest. It's like, what's the end state of what we're doing here? Like, I don't mind going and doing stuff. You know, if we got to go fight, whatever for the country, whatever, but don't, don't BS me with some bullshit. Like, Oh, it's for the, for democracy. You're fighting for democracy. Shut the fuck up. Like what's the real end state here? Because that's what I want to know before 
you know, you go put your life on the line or go, your buddies are putting their lives on the line and stuff like that. And the people that are making the decisions aren't doing that, you know? Right. I mean, yeah, thinking about it now, someone, I was talking to somebody else the other day and they were like, did you have any, you know, coherent politics or like ideology about the U.S. when you joined? And I was like, I sure didn't. Um, and that was a really good thing for me because if I did, like, yeah, look, talk, think about it now. Absolutely. If, if What if we, you know, in 2008, 2009, 2011, all that time, if we had been saying, what's the end state of this? Like, who would have gone to Afghanistan? Well, I think, you know, it's funny, the mid-level managers, you know, your staff and O, like, lieutenant colonels and below are all kind of asking that question, but no one would ask it at that higher level. Like what's the end state here? And a lot of people you hear from a lot of people, it's like, we didn't do 20 years of war. We did 21 year wars, you know, just these one year deployments, new mm -hmm. battalion comes in. This is how we're going to do things. I don't care what the other battalion, you know, okay, cool. Thanks for okay. letting me know what you guys have been doing. I'm going to go do this now. It just never. And the thing too, I think, probably don't want to admit it is a lot of these military guys didn't want the war to end because who wants to serve and not get a chance at combat before you, you know, like a lot of those guys, that's what they wanted was a chance at combat. Right. And you're not going to be the one that says we should end this, you know, I don't right. know. Right. I don't know, man. Uh, one last question. We can wrap it up. Um, writing a book about the military. What, what are the steps you have to take? Like how long did it take to get through the approval process through the DOD and stuff? Mm, yeah, that took a long time. Um, so it was seven months of uh, the review. That's um, not too bad. I've heard it. I've I, th I was expecting over a year. I've heard some pretty abhorrent stories for people trying to get certain releases, and it's just not. They just don't yeah, respond. Uh, I, I think there was a guy who uh, it was in the news recently because I he was in um, the unit as is what he had to call his book mm. because he legally say. You know, the U.S. has never recognized the existence of certain specialized elite task forces or whatever. And his his was like two years or something like that. Yeah. He, you know, he had a very fancy lawyer and like they had to fight a lot. And, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I've actually been told not to. Uh, one guy asked me not to put Delta on his mm -hmm. interview. He said, just refer to me as special mission unit. And it wasn't necessarily because he would have gotten in trouble or anything, uh, but it was because the unit itself was looking down upon people that are coming out and telling their stories, right. you know, and they're like get, basically going to get kicked out of the club kind of deal. You're not going to get invited to the reunion anymore, which oh. I think is fucked up because one people, one, all the stories these Delta guys are coming out and telling are unclassified. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell me a story that someone has told that's been classified and I'll, you know, whatever. And then we can we can figure that out. But all these stories are unclassified. One, two, the American taxpayer deserves to know where their money's going. And <laughs> these guys have stories just like everybody else. And I don't think they signed up for a lifetime of silence. You know, they deserve to have their stories told. If you can write a movie, if you can have a movie like Black Hawk Down come out, then what? There's no big fucking deal for a dude to come on a podcast and talk about stuff, as long as it remains unclassified, which it always does. So, it, right. yeah, I mean, I will say, like, you just said something that's truly fascinating. Uh, when you're a TS, at least, which I have to imagine all those guys did, uh, you do sign a lifetime commitment to if you publish anything, the DOD gets to review it. Mm, I was like, a TS, so I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, one yeah, of those yeah. low nerds that had to wear the special badge when I went into the. <laughs> yeah, it, it's truly a lifetime commitment to to DoD review. Yeah. Okay. I mean. I mean, I'm not. I don't agree with that. I I didn't know that. Like when I signed, like someone must have said that. But you're a 19 year old, and you're like, okay, I'm not gonna write a book. What do I care? Right. Yeah, and I'm gonna read the fine print of every document. <laughs> I've already just absurdly right, but I've already signed 15 forms that day that signed my life away. Like. What do I, you know, what am I going to do about that? I do, I think it's, some of it's so wild, you know, um, like, yeah, the, I think, right, you, if you, like, Deb grew, the, you know, technically the U.S. government has never recognized the existence or something like that, right? We're like Delta, technically the U.S. And so if you were in Delta, you can't go write about it, even though everyone and their mother knows about Delta. The guy that started Delta wrote a book about Delta. <laughs> it's like, like, everyone knows what it is, right? I mean, worst kept secret ever. Whereas the most famous version of this is like, sorry, Tom Clancy, right? Wrote about nuke stuff. Mm. He sort of pieced it all together from like open the, source stuff, open source world, but he was never in. So like nobody can do anything to him. Yeah. 
you if you wrote the exact same book using the exact same information but you were in you can't publish it that's so crazy yeah i mean i i get it to an extent but like i said i mean everybody has a story to tell and it's not fair that these fucking generals and these politicians can get out and write the stories, write books and stuff about the operations that these guys actually did. And then turn right. around and say that those guys aren't allowed to talk about it. Like, get out of here. You know, they I, deserve to make a living or to let their story be known like everybody right. else. That's the, like, so I guess you're, you're right in that like seven months in the grand scheme of things isn't that big a deal, but I, I'm still um, a little annoyed because like I wrote the book in three months and it was supposed to have already been out. It was supposed to come out in August, mm. and it got delayed. And so, like, you talk about, I, I'm fine. I have a very supportive partner, and, like, I'm okay. But guys are trying, if they're trying to make their living off of this, my book got delayed by three months. Like, I don't get paid. Maybe the book doesn't sell as well. Like, there's other stuff happening. Yeah, like, and and for what? Like, I didn't. So yeah, far, I didn't. so far, everything <laughs> I've read in it seems pretty pretty much no, and, and there were there were some things that changed for sure they, they caught a couple of things that i i could argue because i found them i found them open source but like mm -hmm. fine whatever they're allowed to you know they have their preferences that's fine but should have taken seven freaking months i don't think so yeah yeah no i agree are you planning on writing another book at all uh yeah not not about this i think you know i've said um as much as i probably can say about this but um, I've written, I, I wrote like for fun, for practice, I wrote a novel. Um, I've been working on another one that I had an idea for. Um, and I, so I, I went to medical school, but I don't, and I graduated and everything, but I don't practice medicine. I sort of didn't want to deal with that. And I, I've been thinking about writing about the kind of, a lot of the same issues <laughs> that are currently um, plaguing the American uh, healthcare system because it's, screwing a lot of people over and it's uh, there are a lot of things that could be improved dude the melt the the healthcare system for me was something i never thought about right because obviously military you know free medical is as good as it says meaning like there's there's costs that come with the free medical you right. know? um i know plenty of people that have had bad procedures in the military you also don't get to like skip out of work whenever you want like if you want to skip out of work you have to go to your free medical and get seen and get said that you, you can skip out of work and stuff like that. But when I got out and I don't have to pay for medical, you know, my, my VA rating was high enough where I'm covered by the VA and the VA here and I'm in San Diego. So they got a pretty robust system here. I've only had to use them once for like back issues and immediately got like a referral out in town for a physical therapist. So I, unlike a lot of people, I've had good experience so far with the VA, but I also don't have a lot of the major issues that some of the people have. Um, but what blew my mind was going to my first job, civilian job, and then talking about medical insurance. And I'm like, Oh, you know, I don't, I waived it. They don't need to pay for it for me. You know, I've got, I'm covered. And, but I was talking to one of my workers, like how much it costs. And I was like, what? Like you pay how much a month? Like mm -hmm. that is insane. You know, and this is a, a girl in her twenties and right. is paying like hundreds of dollars a month for, for medical insurance. And I'm like, wait, I didn't, I don't know. I never realized it was so much. It's just, it's mind blowing the cost of it. I don't know how to fix it. Um, there right, is, a, yeah. there is an issue obviously though. Yeah, I, I won't claim to know how to fix it now, and even if I do write a book it, I, about it, I might not. But it is it is a racket as it stands. Like, it's mistakes are made in the private world too. Be, be, uh, a guy who I who taught at the med school I went to was just like in the news because he was running two surgeries at the same time and like billing. He defrauded the U.S. government. Oh. Like, he would just leave people open on a table and like go to another room and like come back, and he's big he's a huge muckety muck at this massive massive hospital institution and it's like the, yeah the you know again politics notwithstanding there's like a political term but like the free market ain't solving that uh at least not as it stands right the health insurance yeah situation in america is not being solved by like letting you know lots and lots of giant corporations try and make it better whatever that means it's got to be something with the insurance companies you know and how they're charging and stuff like that I mean, to me the um um oh what was i gonna say i don't know man it's just such a it's just such a, a messed up situation it's just 
what do you do? You know, oh, what I was going to say, when you say, people say the free market isn't going to fix this. At what point can we, is it a free market anymore though? Look, how much, how many regulations are on the medical industry and on any kind of like, yeah, it's a super regulated in a lot of ways and a lot of ways properly. So, right. You know, you're, I'm talking from the outside in, so you can obviously go into more depth if you want on that. But at the same time, you can't really call it a free market when it's so overly regulated that it forces government intervention companies to get involved because you have to have insurance companies you know like i don't know i mean a lot of it like like yeah government so i mean the va is is socialized healthcare like that's what that is for sure um and like the uk is socialized healthcare canada is socialized healthcare they have their own problems of course um other places in europe other places in the rest of the world have their own problems with it but so much of the i will i will 100 percent agree like no matter what my politics might be that plenty of government regulation is just bureaucratic red tape, right? That somebody lobbied in to make themselves some money. Sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, But also tons like insurance companies are who run healthcare in America, not the government, right? The government might run, do you have to have health insurance? Like as a citizen, okay, fine. But who's running healthcare, that's health insurance companies. And so they'll create all of these often like to incentivize them making money, right? They'll create these huge hurdles, hurdles where you hear people, have to drive an hour and a half to get to a PCP because like that's the only thing that their insurance covers. Yeah. Because the company is like, well, yeah, screw you. Like I got mine. I'm making my money. And the the sort of amount of money that they're making and the amount of money that they're charging, if you go and look at the rest of the world, like our outcomes aren't that much better. Like if you look at, you know, just a whole soapbox and stop me at any point in time. Like, there are plenty of like metrics that you can look at. And it's like, well, we spend two, three, four times as much money as other places, and like people aren't healthier because of it. Yeah. No, I, uh, no, I'm with you, man. I, there's something, there's something's got to be done about it. I, and this is someone that again, is not really affected by it. Cause my, I'm either. yeah, I have a disability rating too, right? Like I don't have to go get healthcare in the community. I get from the VA. I know my buddy in Indiana, he prefers his private insurance because I think he's far enough away. F- I think he has to drive to Indianapolis or something if he wants right. to get, and that's an hour drive, you know? And then, and then if you get there and the appointment's fucked up or something, then you just wasted an hour each way. And then mm-hmm. you have to reschedule for another day. Uh, so I totally get why people don't like it. Um, but uh, so far I've had, I don't know, pretty good experience, but dude, it's such a weird world, man. Good luck. I'm, I'll be interested in seeing what you come up with. You know, I'd love to learn more about it. Cause there's gotta be, smart minds got to come together and figure something out. Cause that's crazy that people are just going broke, just trying to afford <clears throat> medical insurance. I just don't, I don't know. Um, where can Ian, where can people find your stuff? I got your book, you know, what the Taliban told me I'm going to, this is being recorded for those that are listening. This is being recorded on Halloween. I'm going to try to release this tomorrow. So that means the book is going to be available next week. I'm going to put the link in the description. Um, but where else can people find more out about you? Yeah, um, I have a website. It's um, ianlfritz.com, or if you just like Google my name or the title of the book, my website will come up. Um, the only plug I would make is if you have like a local bookseller that can that you can get the book from. If you do want to buy it, you know, support local bookshops. They're really really important, and they're you know often can struggle. Uh, if for whatever reason you can't, you know, you can get the book wherever it's sold, Amazon, big store, something like that. But local bookstores are, are really really great institutions, and if you can support them, uh, that's a really nice thing to do. Yeah, for sure, man. Yeah, uh, and then everybody can check my stuff out. Former Action Guys, uh, Former Action News on Instagram. J. Kramer Graphics is my website. If you're looking for group orders, T-shirts, all that stuff, custom graphic design, hit me up. And that's it, man. I really appreciated the conversation. This has been this has been good. Yeah, thank you, man. Thanks for having me on.